I'm not really sure why the Holy Spirit keeps pressing so heavily on my spirit toward the types of messages that are before us today and have been in front of us for the last few weeks. I can only say this. I just listen and I just obey. Um, I have likened at least my thought process toward preaching like this for many years. Um, I read, study, pray, meditate, think on passages and, and, and uh, messages for at least probably four out of the seven days between church services, especially Sunday morning services. And, and so I just kind of pile all of this information in the dump truck. And then on Sunday morning, I just come out here and dump it on you. So I'm not really exactly sure why all of the uh, things that uh, the Lord is filling the dump truck with on a weekly basis are as they are right now. But uh, um, again, I just, I just am trusting that uh, God has a reason for these messages in light of the day that we are living in. And I can say that if we begin to take seriously the power that is given to us as the church, we can see great and amazing things still happen in our lifetime and in the life of our great church. Are we going to have to get up and do some calisthenics? All right. It, it, is, it is very helpful if you'll get into this a little bit, all right? All right, I'm, I'm not saying that you got to do backflips in the aisle or anything like that, but it is helpful if you'll get that scowl off your faces and say amen, and even if you utter a hallelujah under your breath at some time, that will be fine too, all right? But it, it is going to be very helpful because I believe this, that, that uh, when we read in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, there was just about 120 people that turned the world upside down. And in 120 people, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of what we have on our campus this morning, that I still believe the power of God can come down on a church and turn a city upside down. It, I, it, listen, you wouldn't want me to believe anything else, right, as your pastor. And so why don't we just get on board with this together? You know, I, I mean, can I just rub off on you a little bit? Um, I mean, I'm like you. I don't get up every day thinking that I'm just anointed of the Holy Spirit to do something great. But if I'll just give myself over to the Lord on any given day, God can do great things through me. And so as a pastor, as a leader, as a preacher of the gospel, I want to be just someone who fires you up week to week in order to remember day by day that we have a mission. And our mission isn't, guys, to sit around and make money. Our mission in this life is not to, to build our, our castles here on earth. Our mission is to lay up our crowns in heaven. And we're not doing a very good job of it right now. I know, I know I'm not. And I know I'm super convicted by the messages that uh, have uh, been laid on my heart. So as, as uh, we preach today, it's a we, it's not a you. Okay, it's an us, it's not just uh, coming down hard on, on you. But I do believe, and I'm going to say it again so you can kind of get into it, all right? That if we begin to take seriously the power that is given to us as a church, we can see great and amazing things happen in our lifetime and in the life of our great church. I do really believe that. So let's, for this message, we're kind of in the holiday season, right? It's, it's here whether we are ready for it or not. The Hallmark movies are telling us that. My uh, favorite holiday movie of all time, and uh, you, can, you can throw rocks at me later if you want to. It's not Christmas vacation, by the way. But my favorite holiday movie of all time is, is It's a Wonderful Life. 
wow. That, now that got the biggest amen of all. I did, I did not expect that this morning. I appreciate that. Man, I tell you, I, I, I know how it ends. I know I've seen it at the Paramount Theater. I've seen it on TV hundreds of times. I've got the video. I mean, I watch it, and Kim and I make a point to watch it every year, and I cry at the end every single time. I do, man. I can't help myself. I'm a big old baby. I cry at, uh, you know, Folgers commercials. So um, I, I just, man, it just gets to me. So what we're going to do this morning is take a sort of George Bailey look at what life would be without the church. What would life be without the church? You know, believe it or not, we actually get scriptural help here. I'm not just pulling a rabbit out of the hat this morning or making a text fit into a theme, which, by the way, is a real pet peeve of mine as a preacher. I don't really, I mean, I have some great ideas all the time, but if it's not really scripture, why should I preach that, right? So uh, we actually get good scriptural evidence of what life would be without the church in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The day of Christ as what is referred to in verse 2, that that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and then, or and then that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who will opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, setteth in the temple of God, showing himself to the whole world that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then, after he's taken out of the way, then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall then consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Hmm. With this text before us this morning, let's pray. Lord, it's obvious by the words we've read that this is a very serious topic. It's a very serious message. It's an amazing, serious thought what our world will be without the church. And so, Lord, I'm just asking you right now to 
give us the ability to focus for the next few minutes on how this applies to us today and how we can use what is being taught us to make an impact on the world around us. Because, Lord, we are not in heaven yet. We are still on this earth. And we who are believers in you are still called to be your witnesses. And we still have the opportunity, Lord, to see souls saved before it is eternally too late. So I'm asking you, Lord, to free us from distraction. Lord, I'm, helping you, I'm asking you to help us not to move around, but to stay in tune with what you have for us in these next few minutes. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, in these verses, as we break them down, we see some things that we need, okay? First of all, we need a constant awareness of our day here. We need a constant awareness of our day, the day in which we are living. Verses 1 through the first part of verse 3 tell us this. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Okay, by speaking of the gathering together here in verse 1, Paul is talking about as we gather together as a church. All right, that's what he is speaking of. Remember, we the church, as we recall last Sunday morning's message, we the church are literally the called out ones. That's what the word church means. We are the called out ones, and we are called out for the sake of carrying out the great commandment, love God and love others. It's our, it's our uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Our mission statement. Um, it's also our logo. That's what I was trying to say. That we are carrying out the great commandment while also carrying out the great commission as a church. We are, again, recalling last Sunday morning's message very quickly, we are the vehicle chosen to voice the views of Jesus which leads us to victory over the enemy in the world. That's who we are. The vehicle, the church is the vehicle chosen to voice the views of Jesus which leads to victory over the enemy of this world. The emphasis of verse 1 comes when we consider what is imminent, what is on the horizon, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ begs to be the focus of these verses. Unfortunately, many distractions have hindered our churches today from this focus. And dare I say, it even hinders us at times. Originally, for the Thessalonian church, when they were reading this letter, they would have reacted differently. They would have seen this as, as uh, much more pressing. Surely they would have been motivated to keep carrying out the duties of the church and excited about what this new day with Jesus would have for them. Today, though, we might find ourselves a little bit numb to a talk or a message about the return of Jesus. You know why that is? Because we've heard it for a long time, and it hasn't happened yet. Can I just tell you, if, if, I, was, if I was God... I would have already come back. Right? Because I would have already said, hey, those guys are miserable enough. And 
things in the world are wicked enough already and and it's time to it's time to get this thing going but i'm not god and for the maybe one lost soul that might be sitting in our sanctuary today we can be thankful that he has not come back because since he's not come back we are still living under the age of grace there is still a season a time an age a, a, a number of years that we are living in even though the clock's ticking where salvation is still freely extended but again we might find ourselves somewhat numb to the talk about the return of Jesus. For this reason, we have lost our eternal mindset in favor of doing the best we can with what we have here on earth. You know, that's kind of the American way now. Do your best. Just be all you can be while you're here on this earth and in doing so, we have completely lost touch with an, a, an eternal mindset. Verse 2 tells us that uh, don't be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor as by this letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't let anything distract you from the fact that Jesus Christ can return at any moment. Therefore, we need to be ready. Don't lose out on our eternal mindset. Ironically, Paul writes this letter and this particular uh, instruction format here for the Thessalonians, which, by the way, they are informed about the second coming in the first and the second letter. Because they believed that they had already missed out on the day of the Lord. They thought that they were living and, and Jesus already came back and forgot them. Listen, here in 2019, almost 2020, sometimes I think the same thing. I mean, did Jesus just forget? Did he fall asleep up there somewhere? And, and, and is he just like, I mean, somebody need to, will, will somebody go, hey, if, you, if your brother or sister's asleep next to you, wake them up real quick. Because, because that's kind of what we're thinking about Jesus. He must have fallen asleep on the job. Right? Because he's supposed to have already come back and got us, right? That's at least somewhat what, what uh, we might be thinking. And for the Thessalonians, they thought they had already gotten left. That it already happened. Today, though, we look at all of this as just a bunch of talk. And that it's never going to happen. But you know what? Just because that's the way we think, just because that's the way the Thessalonians were thinking, doesn't change the truth. That Jesus is coming again. And He is going to set things straight. There is a process that is talked about here that is going to happen in our world. But, but the fact of the matter is eternity could tick into place at any moment for any of us could it be that the first part of verse 3 then is happening right before our eyes where he says let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come the day of the lord except there come a falling away first talk of the day of the lord just does not bring about a sense of urgency in us as a church anymore. It really doesn't rattle our cage a whole lot anymore. We've heard it, we've dealt with it, we've filed it away in our minds, in our hearts, wherever that is, but it really doesn't charge us up to get ourselves motivated to have any kind of an eternal mindset. We just get lost in the shuffle of the day-to-day, -day, whatever's going on. And we have forgotten 
that this could be the day. That we could be right on the last hour of our time on earth. Because I remind you prophetically, nothing has to happen. Nothing at all has to unfold for Jesus to come back. And to set eternity in motion. Everything is in place. And you know, we're just past the generation. Some are still here with us, but in the older generation that saw the miraculous thing that happened when Israel actually became a nation again. You know, back in 1948, right? So when that happened, all of our 19th century Bible scholars that thought they knew what was going on and wrote about it in the 19th century, all of their writings about prophecy pretty much tossed those out the window. Because now all of a sudden there's a state of Israel. And now all of a sudden there's been talk for many decades about a new temple, right? There's been talk about, about the revival of, of the Jew and, and there's been talk and there's been a gathering of Jewish people back into their land that was promised them. And so if you ask me, from that point on, nothing ever will ever have to happen again to set in motion the day of the Lord. Now, without going into great detail about the day of the Lord, let me just tell you the trigger. The triggering mechanism to start in motion eternity and the day of the Lord is the rapture. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But the rapture of the church is the triggering mechanism for the day of the Lord and all of the things that will happen after that leading up to the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. That'll be somewhere around a seven-year process. Okay? I say somewhere around because if you read the book of Daniel, and I don't want to go really too deep into prophecy, but boy, do I ever want to start preaching prophecy to you guys because I love prophecy. Um, but without going too deep into it, the rapture of the church happens, but what triggers the seven-year time frame known as the tribulation, you guys have heard of that, right? The seven-year tribulation, what, what marks the beginning of that seven years is the signing of the peace treaty between who will become the Antichrist and Israel. That's what starts the seven years. So there will be a rapture. And then there will be the signing of this peace covenant. It's talked about in Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 9. And once that signing takes place, then the two witnesses show up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Remember them? And, uh, and there's seven years of tribulation. We know it as the great tribulation. Which ultimately leads to the second coming of Christ. The battle of Armageddon and all of that. The thousand year millennium after that and then on into eternity after the great white throne judgment some of you are looking at me in your head spinning and you're like going oh my goodness what is all this i promise if if the lord tarries we'll get to all this i love the charts i love to tell you show you all these different things but for right now you just kind of got to take my word for it it's what is known of as the day of the lord okay that entire little outline that i gave you very quickly is the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church. But look, what is happening right now before our eyes is we have just kind of fallen away from that. We've just kind of not very excited about that anymore. We've just kind of like, oh man, Jesus must have forgot us, so let's just live our lives. Eat, drink, and be merry. M-E-R-R-Y. You know? No, no need to worry about... Uh, I mean, Jesus forgot about us, so let's just do the best we can. And because of that, guys, our church and churches are feeling the effects of that. Are we living in a day 
where there is a falling away. Yes, there are fewer people that go to church now, any church, than ever in the history, and there's more people on the planet. While I was in Coleman, I watched the percentage of, of people that went to church on Sunday drop from 10% to about 7%. That's in a town of about 5,000 people, a county of about seven. What do you think the percentage of people are in church today just within the city limits of Sweetwater is? And we've got somewhere around 10,000 people in our city. Do you think there's 1,000 people in church today? Where are the rest of them? Guess who bumps into them every week? We do. What are we doing about it? Not much. Because we don't have an eternal mindset anymore. Because we have fallen away from having an eternal mindset. The Thessalonians were worried that they missed it. We are not even worried about it anymore. It doesn't even come up on our calendar anymore. Talk of the day of the Lord just does not bring about a sense of urgency in us as a church. For this reason, we are quickly heading toward a day of life without church. That's where we're heading. You realize that. Unless we get some sort of an eternal mindset again about us. We are heading toward a day of life without church. What are we then, as Broadway Baptist Church, going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? We have to ask ourselves this. So after the falling away, then, then, verse 3 ends with, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he as God, sitting in the temple of God, showeth himself, or showing himself, that he is God. And then Paul says, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? After the falling away, then we see the coming of the Antichrist. Okay? Our world is taking shape just as God's word instructs us here. What I am saying today is, if you imagine for just a moment, life without Broadway Baptist Church in Sweetwater, Texas. What would our landscape look like? Would our city even realize that we weren't here anymore? What I'm asking you to do is wake up to the fact that we need to buck this trend. All right? How many of you like to be trendsetters? See, I do. I like to be trendsetter. I like to be on the cutting edge. I like to, I like to be that per I like to be the one that bucks the trend. That doesn't say, eh, just because everybody, you know, has gone to jeans and a, and a t-shirt to preach in, I'm still going to wear a suit. I don't know. I just, I, if everybody was wearing a suit, maybe then I'd wear the jeans and t-shirt. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying that we need to be the church that, again, comes back to an eternal mindset that starts caring about this and seeing souls saved. You know how souls begin to be saved? We start caring. Because if we care about souls being saved, then we probably are going to start praying about souls being saved. And if we start praying about souls being saved and asking God to give us opportunities to talk to people about being saved, guess what happens? People start showing up. They need to know about being saved. And then all of a sudden, we, we got to keep the baptistry filled all the time. Because people are following the Lord in baptism. Week after week. Maybe we start having an invitation on Wednesday night again. 
Wouldn't that be amazing? Maybe I could start preaching evangelism all the time, which I would love to do. And then we'll worry about discipleship from house to house like they did in Acts. Well, that just blew you away, didn't it? I mean, look. We're talking about the gathering of the church. We're talking about it getting an eternal mindset. But in between here, we understand that there is a falling away. We need to buck that trend because there is certainly the spirit of Antichrist in our world today, as 1 John talks about. Paul is talking about here the literal Antichrist. Okay? And our world is taking shape just as God's word instructs us here. God is about to give the world exactly what it's begging for. You realize that, right? God is about to give the world a godless society. That's what's coming. When this happens, it'll be the moment Satan's been waiting for. As he steps in and takes control. He will be allowed to have this control for a certain length of time by the one who is in ultimate control, God. Interesting to me is verse 5. Where Paul says, remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things? That is interesting to me because Paul reminds the Thessalonian believers, that even in his three short weeks with them, according to Acts 17, he spoke to them about this. Now think about that for a second. Paul only got to spend three weeks with this church. And one of his messages dealt with the day of the Lord. In three weeks... Would that be one of my top messages, is the question I have to ask myself. But it was for Paul. Because the day of the Lord is that important. Because the day of the Lord is that imminent. The church in the days of the Thessalonians had to be just as ready as the church in the day of us. For the Lord's coming. So in the sequence of things important to speak about, Paul added this as one of the messages he preached or teaching he taught in his very short amount of time there. So once the falling away happens, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, he makes himself God, goes actually into the temple of God, according to verse 4. We know that's the abomination of desolation. Shows himself that he is God. They, the, uh, Satan develops the unholy trinity. Okay, The unholy trinity, Satan acts like God. He has a Christ known as the Antichrist, the one world ruler, the son of perdition, as he's talked about here. And then Revelation tells us about a false prophet. The false prophet is the anti-Holy Spirit. The anti-Holy Spirit points everybody to the Antichrist. He even builds a humongous statue and causes everybody, like in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, to worship before this statue. And he even has power, that does the anti-Holy Spirit, to cause this big, huge statue, beast-looking thing, to come to life. It's wild! But once again, God allows Satan to have this time. And he's doing everything he can to be God. And Satan is not very original. So he just mimics what God has done. See, Satan's not that smart. All right? He's not that smart. He just mimics what God has done. And all of these things are depicted here after the falling away. 
then the coming of the Antichrist. But then we see in verses 6 and 7 the cry of the church. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now it was so important because the cry from the voice of the church leads people to know the truth. Okay? It, this, this is vitally important. Now you know what withholdeth, um, that he might be revealed. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The truth is obviously what sets us free. The thing that withholds and is letting is the Holy Spirit in verses 6 and 7. Okay? Now you know what withholdeth. What's withholding the Antichrist, Satan, from taking charge of the earth? The Holy Spirit. Okay? And that mystery of iniquity, it's already at work. I mean, there's certainly the spirit of Antichrist all around us. But the Holy Spirit's not letting him have control completely. We know that the Holy Spirit resides in the heart of the believer. Right? When we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us. Guys, we are the church. This will be true until he, the Spirit, is, according to verse 7, taken out of the way. So when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, that must mean that we as believers aren't here anymore. All right? So actually, Paul had already talked about this to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. So the Holy Spirit will be taken out with the believers in Jesus when we are raptured out of this world. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Now that's where we get our word rapture. That we are literally caught up together with them, those who are dead in Christ, who have risen first, and we join them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we What's the next word? Ever. Ever, which is short for forever. Right? So shall we forever be with the Lord. And then ultimately, Paul says, comfort one another with these words. I'm comforted by that. I'm greatly comforted by that. So we see the cry of the church. But when the church is taken out of the way, the Holy Spirit who is withholding the evil... Us as the church, withholding the evil from this world. Can I just go ahead and, and just make this real practical for a second? Okay. Did anybody stay up almost four years ago, all, almost all night, because the news media couldn't believe who actually got voted in as our president? Could... Did, did y'all step and watch that? I mean, they just like went on and on and on. Wouldn't ever really say it because nobody could believe it. Can I just tell you that we've gotten four years almost of, of a respite as a church? Okay, now I'm not saying that I am all for our president necessarily. I'm just saying that if somebody else would have been president, there would have been quite an enemy to the church at the head of our nation. And the same could be true in, in another few months. You know that, right? 
And the, and the enemy is, is all around and swirling. But we as a church, with the Holy Spirit in our hearts, are withholding, keeping back, or at least we should be, unless we've fallen away. So are we going to be the church that falls away? Or are we going to be the church that bucks the trend and keeps on lighting the light, keeps on telling the truth, keeps on taking advantage of a landscape that God has graciously given us to keep on telling the truth without persecution? Because guys, persecution is coming it really is i i'm not a prophet but it's coming where we actually have enemies trying to shut our doors then what if we've already fallen away then we're just easy prey for the enemy or we're a church that stands up and says "Uh uh-uh we're battling for the truth the cry of the church ultimately comes the condemnation of the world back in chapter 4 of 2nd Thessalonians verse 8 he therefore that despiseth oh sorry I didn't flip my page over and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth aren't you glad that God's still going to control all of that shall destroy him with the brightness of his coming Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Oh, this Antichrist is going to be an awful character. You know, when you read words like uh, John 14, 6, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. You know, the Antichrist will probably use those same words. I am the way, the truth, the life. Blasphemy is what revelation says he comes speaking with (sighs) he comes with all deceivableness in verse 10 of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved guys that's where our great commission comes in we are to be telling others how to be saved For this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned or condemned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's not up to us to say, but it's up to us to tell. It's up to us to shine. So the condemnation of the world is before us in those verses. After the rapture of the church, everything changes in the world as we know it. As we have already seen, the world will experience life without church. Thus, the presence of the Holy Spirit and godly influence will be gone. God will allow such an ungodly and satanic influence to permeate the world that it becomes a strong delusion leading people to believe that Satan, as or the Antichrist, as he will proclaim, is the way, the truth, and the life. It will lead people to take a mark. You know what that is, right? A mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they'll be able to eat. It's called the mark of the beast in Revelation. A strong delusion will cause people to think that he is really the only way. And I've got to follow him. And if you think for a minute that I'm just going to hold out and watch all this unfold and then I'll trust Christ, if you think it will work like that, guys, I'm afraid to tell you you're probably wrong. Because if you've heard the truth and shunned Jesus Christ as Savior today, You have no assurance that your heart will ever be touched again by the Holy Spirit to receive Him tomorrow. That's why the Bible tells us today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Because if you've heard the truth and the Holy Spirit has knocked on your heart's door, 
Now's the time to receive. Because then will most likely be too late. All of this leads directly to the world's condemnation. As they follow the lie of the Antichrist. That's what life will be without church. It's what our city could be in some form if we don't get a real burden for our church, for our city, for souls all around us that are lost and on their way to condemnation. I don't want that. You know, I've, I've had some people in this world that I don't really like that much. But I've got to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever disliked someone enough that I would want them to spend eternity in hell. I really don't. I just can't believe. I can't not love even someone that I really might not like a whole lot and still want them to go there. As we are informed about these things today, are we motivated as a church to be more of a voice in our community for the cause of Christ? Or are we just going to continue to do our part in getting the world prepared for life without the church? Are we going to get serious about the most important thing in this world? Souls. Or are we going to continue to show how fallen away we are from being passionate about Jesus and about the things of God? Today we have clearly seen in God's own word where the world is heading. I ask you this question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Uh, it's going to happen. Because it's in God's word. And God's word is true.